I was busily trying to figure out if this microphone was live, and now I find it actually is not live in this room. Uh, it is here only uh, in order for people on the webcast to be able to, uh, uh, to hear me. Uh, good afternoon. I'm George Dixon. I'm a professor of biology, and I'm also the vice president for university research here at the University of Waterloo. And uh, I would like to welcome everyone to our research talk today. Uh, perhaps to give you a little bit of history, uh, we initiated these research talks about a year ago now, I think, more or less, and they're going to be a continuing activity at the university, probably at least for a year and maybe six, depending upon uh, what the opportunity is. Uh, they really come out of a genesis of an idea that while we spend a lot of time talking about the research activity at Waterloo outside the university, we perhaps tend not to spend as much time providing information to people within the university as to the types of research activity that goes here. So while folks from outside the university are always welcome to attend this type of thing, uh, the intent is really more targeted at folks from inside the university, students, staff members, faculty members, who actually would like to know what's going on in the office next to them, or actually more truthfully at Waterloo, what's going on in the building two or three over from where you're actually living. Today we have uh, an outstanding speaker, uh, Dr. Heather Keller, and Heather tells me that uh, she has joined the University of Waterloo four years ago, is my understanding. It actually, I think I was talking to her when she joined the university, and it seems like rather less time than four years, but... Uh, and Heather um, is, as it says up here, uh, a professor in the Department of Kinesiology, uh, she also holds a Schlegel Research Chair in Nutrition and Aging, and she's a member of the Schlegel University of Waterloo Research Institute for Aging. Um, she's also chair of the Canadian Malnutrition Task Force, um, where she leads a group of interprofessional uh, individuals focused on improving the identification and treatment of malfunction in acute care settings. I think it's fair to say that Heather's work focuses overall on trying to improve nutritional status and food intake of the elderly in a number of different settings. Uh, I could go on listing all of Heather's accomplishments and one type of thing. I suspect you can get off that from the website of the university quite easily. And I don't want to cut in too much on the amount of time that she is going to have to uh, tell her tale to you, so to speak. So based on that, Heather, welcome. The floor is yours. much. I'm not sure. Can everybody hear me okay? I'll be talking at this level. That's all right. So we don't need another mic. All right. That's good. So it's a pleasure to be here to talk with you a little bit about my research that I'm doing here at the University of Waterloo. And as George said, I've just been here three and a half, almost four years. And my research program has gone way up since I've been here because a research chair gives you lots of opportunity to do research and also a great research office that supports that. So thank you to all the folks here at Waterloo that have made this happen. I'm going to talk today about who and what we're talking about first off to understand um, the issues I'm going into this with. Why is this relevant to you guys here who are not necessarily working in this area? What do we already know about older adults and nutrition? The complexity of food intake, you probably know it's complex, but I'm going to talk about how even more complex it is than you think right now. <coughs> Excuse me and give you a sense of something called making the most of mealtimes. It's a concept that I developed with some research colleagues that is helping to basically provide the foundation for the work that I'm doing. What are the gaps that we have currently around uh, knowing how to provide nutrition to older adults? I'm going to focus in on two projects that are currently underway. So I don't have results yet, but just to show you what we're doing to hopefully solve some of these gaps and understandings around the vulnerability of older adults and then have hopefully some big takeaways and some discussion at the end. So who are we talking about? Older adults are basically 50, 55, 60, 65 plus. Some of us in this room, and I'm getting very close, and when I started in this area, I thought I'm never gonna reach 50, well, anyway. But the point is, this is the most heterogeneous group in, in terms of a population group that we have, right? If you think about a person that's 70, they could have just been married and just had a child if they happen to be a male, for example. They may, uh, they may be a new father. They may also be a person who's lived with MS for 30 years. 
They may also be a person that ran a marathon for the fourth time. They may be a person who actually has been in a wheelchair for 20 years because of some condition. It's extremely heterogeneous compared to other segments of our population. And so one approach doesn't fit all. And that's meant that my research has had to follow different streams based on where we might find older adults. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go forward. So it's a very diverse group, which makes it challenging then to do research in this area and think about how we might provide for potential vulnerability in this group. As well, you're all probably aware of the demographic shift that's going on around us. One in three Canadians in 50 short years is going to be over the age of 65. That's a huge shift, right? Yeah. So that means people over the age of 65 are going to be doing other things that they weren't doing now, that they're doing at that time, like working, for example, until they're 80, perhaps. They might be doing a variety of other things, but they're going to shift the way we do everything. And they are already, right? So that means this is an important group to be looking at in terms of keeping them healthy for as long as possible. So I'm going to talk about malnutrition today. And that probably you think, what is she talking about malnutrition in older adults? We live in Canada. No one's malnourished in Canada. Well, depending on how you define it, yes, there is malnutrition in Canada. And I, like, I like to use the term undernutrition. It's a little bit more appropriate for what I do in my work. And so this is defined as basically an adequate intake of energy, protein, and or micronutrients. So in this case, people that are obese could also be malnourished, right? If they're not eating the right types of food for their body, okay? Malnutrition or undernutrition happens when you have sustained, long-term <coughs> poor intake. But the key is that it changes, and do I have the right button here? It's the blue one on top? Oh, which one is the... Can you turn it on? Absolutely. This is not my thingy. <laughs> Sorry about that. Great. Blue one. Blue one. All right. The key is it changes function. We all don't eat enough vitamin C on a daily basis, I imagine, or B12 or vitamin D or whatever. But the point is, is it sustained long enough to see a functional change in the body? That's malnutrition, when you see the functional change in the body. So osteoporosis can be considered malnutrition in a way because it's a calcium deficit of the body. There's lots of other things that go on why we become osteoporotic, not just because of low calcium intake. But for example, B12 as well, you would see a long-term uh, low intake that isn't functionally deficient for many years. And that's when we see actual malnutrition, when we see things like macrocytic anemia, et cetera. So it's a functional change in the body that we're looking for. It could be muscle loss, weakness, poor immunity, decreased capacity for recovery, decreased cognition. All those could be endpoints of malnutrition. The key also with this definition is that malnutrition responds to feeding. There's many reasons why you might lose muscle mass, for example, like you're not moving very much, right? But if it responds to refeeding, that means it's probably got a genesis in nutritional status, all right? And so that's the key other thing that we have to think about. So people, for example, in hospital waste muscle and tissue because of an inflammatory process. Some of it is because of what they are not eating, but also the cytokines in the body are ramped way up, causing them to burn nutrients and fuel, okay? And that's something that doesn't respond to refeeding. It's uh, something going on in the body. So that's not pure malnutrition we're talking about here. And when I talk about nutrition risk, which you'll hear me say that term often because it's hard to measure this thing we call malnutrition, it's really vulnerability to this state of being malnourished, okay? So just to get some terminology out of the way. You may not have known it, but this was the inaugural Canadian Malnutrition Week. And as George indicated, I chair something called the Canadian Malnutrition Task Force. This is a group of national um, researchers, um, clinicians who are basically trying to address this issue of malnutrition in Canada. And again, you probably don't know that this thing exists, but I'm going to talk to you about how it actually does exist in our society. And so we've developed some uh, materials, and I encourage you to go see uh, this YouTube video that we created, all to raise awareness with the public, with health professionals, hospitals, primary care providers, government, that this is an issue that we have to start addressing. Okay. So why is nutrition important to your health? Well, I like to use this theory as a basis for this because it helps to bring 
what we eat with the other parts of our life together. And it's called the quantum health expectancy theory. And it's pretty basic. It goes along like this, that we're born basically with certain quality and quantity of life at birth. And this is dependent on your fetal health, on your parental health, and on your genetics. Okay, so if, if you come from a long-lived family, you've got a better quantum, potentially, all right? However, post-birth, there's environmental assaults that can erode that quantum. Smoking, pollution, not moving, not eating the right things. Those all erode this quantum. So we could have been given great genes, but we don't do much with it, and we actually erode that away. Also, healthful behaviors can support the quantum. And those healthful behaviors or modifiable behaviors are those on the right-hand side of the slide. You can see that diet is top there. So not being obese as well, not smoking, social interaction, positive attitude, limiting stress. You've heard about all these things in the media already that are things that promote health and longevity, right? And it's because of this idea of the quantum and the potential that's environmental as well as genetic basis to our health. So just to try to unfold this a little bit more, if what we eat affects all of our body tissues, functioning, and overall health, this means that all these things that are linked to disease and health and longevity are associated with what we eat. Makes sense, right? However, we also like to eat for pleasure, right? And this is where it becomes the challenge because quality of life is built into food. Who doesn't like chocolate cake unless you're allergic to chocolate, right? And so we have to think about the fact that some of these disease states also affect our quality of life, right? And where is this tension between eating well for health and also attaining quality of life and food, right? And if, as you can imagine, as people age and maybe become more and more challenged with um, end-of-life issues, cancer, things that are affecting their overall health, maybe what they eat for quality of life is more important than nutrition, right? So that chocolate cake for a person who is dying of cancer is probably more relevant than having lots of antioxidants in your diet. That's my view as a dietitian anyway. <laughs> All right, you won't hear that from other dietitians very soon. So just to give you some evidence for, again, this idea between diet and health. And so again, you've probably heard of many of these things already in the literature, in the media. Saturated fat, cholesterol, trans fat, all of them associated with cardiovascular disease and their prevention if you don't consume those things. The fatty acids that are in fish oils are known to promote cardiovascular health and improve insulin sensitivity. You see increased incidence of dementia with high saturated fat diets, calories, and alcohol, and low intake of anti antioxidants, fish, and methionine. These are all things you've heard about before, right? And so there is this relationship between diet, what we eat, and our overall health. And it goes across pretty much most disease states that we think consider chronic disease states. In terms of frailty, this is now an issue I just want to turn your attention to. This is a big issue in the geriatric or older adult world. If you go to any conference on older adults, this is often a key topic of conversation because frailty is what leads to people going into acute care or long-term care, being that revolving door in the healthcare system because they've fallen and broken a hip, for example. And so geriatricians and others are very much focused on how do we figure out how to keep people from being frail or at least delay that frailty, okay? Certainly frailty has some hormonal basis, some, um, changes that happen with aging that we can't necessarily influence. Certainly pharma is trying really hard to find some drugs that might do that. But diet also and exercise, I'm not gonna talk more about that today, but those two things together also influence frailty. And so just to show you one study that is really quite nice, and I like to show this to folks when they talk about frailty, because they sometimes say, oh well, they're just old and they're frail. No, you can actually do something about it, is this idea of protein. So those who are, uh, this is a study that came out of uh, Spain, I believe. It was a three-year study in older women, and they followed these women forward in time over three years. They measured what they ate, and then measured what happened to their function or frailty over time. And they found that those with the lowest protein at 0.7 grams per kilogram body weight actually lost 40% more muscle mass than those with the highest protein intake, so 1.1 grams per kilogram body weight. The key thing here is that our recommendations for older adults, any of my students in the room know what the recommendation is? 0.8 grams per kilogram body weight. So our dietary recommendations are actually behind what the science says is the better practice. And so a lot of people are talking about, we need to be pushing up protein intake for older adults, okay? 
any of you that might be over the age of 50 and exercise a lot, you, you realize you have to actually exercise more to keep the function in terms of how long you can run without getting out of breath, et cetera. That's this aging process that we're seeing happen. And it can lead to something called sarcopenia, which is basically extensive muscle strength and muscle mass loss with age. Diet has a part to play in this because we don't think people are necessarily thinking about high quality protein after the age of 50 sufficiently high enough to actually stop that sarcopenia. So basically what we're talking about is a 50% increase in protein intake over the age of 50 than when you're under 50, right? That's an interesting message when you think about it. Some other things as, as well as socioeconomic function, I won't go into those too much here. The other key result, and this came from a Canadian work actually, show that nutrition risk independently associated with five-year mortality in older men. This is a community study. So showing the relevance of nutrition when you account for disease and education, all the other things you might think are associated with death in older adults, nutrition itself and nutrition risk measured with a very basic questionnaire actually predicts this thing. So what are older adults eating in Canada? Well, we actually don't know very much. We have a study from 1972, probably before most of you were born in this room. Then we had a series of provincial studies that were based on food frequency questionnaires, which is not the best quality evidence. And then we had the CCHS in 2008. So this is where all these results come from. The, a variety of studies that were done in the provinces basically show that most nutrients are below the recommendations for older adults. They're not eating enough. Same thing with the four food groups. And then the most recent study, the Canadian, um, um, Canadian Community Health Survey 2.2, uh, which was 2008, so that 65% of older adults do not co consume five servings of vegetables and fruit a day, okay? And that's actually the minimum. You should be consuming about eight when you're that age group. And 34% of older adults are at nutrition risk, okay? So this is a big problem. To come, as you may know, is the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging, and they just finished the data collection over 50,000 Canadians, and they have nutrition risk screening in there, as well as food intake information. So we'll have more up-to-date information and on a longitudinal basis to understand how that influences health of older adults. So that's to come and hopefully will be a great boon to helping our research and thinking about interventions. If you want the short answer though, this is it. Basically the Mediterranean diet and, if you, and I'll show you some of the research behind this in a moment, but this is what most people are recommending for longevity, for health, for chronic disease prevention. This idea that we mix physical activity in with a more um, plant-based diet, relatively little amounts of, um, of uh, protein that is high in terms of fat, especially meat here, right? And having instead legumes as a base to our protein intake, olive oil because it's got some really interesting components to it. We'll talk about those in a bit more. And then, of course, a little, little bit of white, not a lot, and with meals, okay? So that's the Mediterranean diet. And so I'll give you a bit of evidence behind that. So we know that high antioxidant and vitamin content diets promote longevity, improve chronic disease um, prevention, et cetera. And that's been long term. Basically, a high Mediterranean diet also has lots of antioxidants in it. We also know that olive oil is loaded with polyphenols, which are meant to be also potentially anti-inflammatory and all these wonderful things about them that help our health. People have identified that the Mediterranean diet is also low glycemic index, polyphenols affect the pathways associated with aging, and we also know that eating patterns are associated with longevity that are consistent with the Mediterranean diet plan, so <coughs> higher fruit and vegetable intake, low fat, dairy, poultry grains, etc. There's also been some research to show that telomere length, which is sort of an indication of aging process in the body, is better with a Mediterranean diet. So they've seen people that consume the Mediterranean diet for most of their lives, they have longer telomeres, which is a good thing. And then we see um, actual studies looking at Mediterranean diet itself associated with reduced heart disease, cancer, and maybe even cognitive impairment. The research is still out on that, I think. Key for us to know here is that it's the Canadian Consortium on Neurodegeneration and Aging, the CCNA, Group 6 is actually working on doing this Mediterranean style diet in the Canadian context because much of the research to date that's shown the benefit to heart disease and cancer and cognition is based in Mediterranean countries, right? Can we adapt that eating and lifestyle to here in Canada? And we'll see. The answer is still not there yet. So why does poor food intake occur in older adults? Well, there's food apathy, which is basically people just not interested in eating anymore, 
right? And reduce physical ability. And from the CCHS, we've got some stats to short, show you that this is a relatively prevalent problem. So for example, reduced physical ability, 44% of people on, this, on the CCHS survey reported disability over the age of 65. And 42% didn't drive. Imagine trying to get groceries when you don't drive. Some of you in this room probably don't drive and you have to get your groceries home, right? Getting your milk on the, on the bus, it's not easy. Now imagine you're 80. <laughs> it's really hard, right? Restricted income, 42% were in the lowest income in this survey as well. Depression, socialization, neglect. 49% had low social support based on self-report. 43% had infrequent social participation. 62% reported depression. And 49% lived alone. And dentition and um, multimorbidity, medication use, cognitive impairment, also big factors. And we found in this survey, 54% were on five or more medications, which is an indication of what we call comorbidity, many conditions. And then finally, 46% describe poor oral health. So basically, we've got a problem, right? We've got lots of risk factors that we think are going to be associated with malnutrition happening in our Canadian older adult population. Just to show you a little bit more about this idea of nutrition risk in older adults, so again, that's vulnerability towards malnutrition. That's how I'm defining it here for you today. In this study, they used the Screen 2 tool, which is something I actually developed a long time ago, and it's still being used, which is great. Uh, but basically, 34% were identified to be at nutrition risk, and these are the things that put them at risk. So having weight change, almost half, 27% reporting a poor appetite, 26% reporting a swallowing difficulty, 24% skipping meals, 37% low fruit and vegetable intake, 42% eating alone, and 52% describing cooking difficulties. So no wonder we have a potential problem with low food intake and potentially malnutrition. The challenge is we've got a vicious and destructive cycle potentially happening as well. So I'll just walk you through this. Think, for example, let's say you're a middle-aged or later adult, close to 60. Let's say you've been working out and you hurt yourself and you have to go on crutches for six months because you're trying to be the weekend warrior, right? And you end up gaining a lot of weight because you're not moving the way you were before the exercise. Then you start cutting back what you eat, the low food intake, and you end up losing weight. But guess what? Because you're not moving very much anymore, you actually lose muscle. And you lose muscle faster than someone who's 40 who does the very same thing as you do because of this thing called sarcopenia and all the pathophysiology behind it with hormones because you happen to be over 60 that are going to speed that up. Okay? Now you lose muscle. And we know that when you lose muscle, you actually lose appetite and interest in eating as well. Energy goes down in terms of need for the body. You don't eat as much, poor food intake, and you have this very vicious cycle that goes on. You can think about any point in this happening. So poor appetite could be the genesis. Let's say bereavement. You don't feel like eating. You then don't choose to eat foods that you should eat. Perhaps you eat things that are easy to eat. You don't make a meal for yourself losing, again, muscle mass. Remember that data I showed you that you need enough protein in your diet or you're going to lose muscle, right? Or let's say you actually go to hospital. You're quite fine and dandy. You go in for elective surgery, but there's a few complications. You end up being bedridden. You lose body weight. You lose muscle. Which, and you get out of hospital. You're not as hungry because you've lost lean body tissue, which drives much of our energy needed in the body. Low food intake. Again, the vicious cycle. So how do we intervene? That's the key, right? So there's lots of ways that this can happen. What can we do to change the trajectory? And this is where I'm trying to do my work in terms of thinking about older adults in Canada. And so we need to understand what influences eating behavior first off and design interventions and test their effect on that eating behavior. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the making the most of mealtimes concept. And this took me 20 years to figure out. I'm not very bright. And uh, <laughs> I, worked in, I worked in clinical care a long time ago. And it was a veterans hospital. So they already had better quality uh, care in terms of number of staffing compared to other similar sorts of places because the vets got extra funding. So they had great care in terms of staff. We made our own food in that hospital. So it was better than if you had to truck it in in terms of being flexible and being responsive to the needs of the patients there. But there were still some people that didn't want to eat. And that bothered me. You know, here we got great staff to help them. We got great food for them to eat, and they still don't eat. And it puzzled me for a long time until I did some research um, over the last decade talking to people with dementia. And they said 
this is what mealtimes are to us. And I realized, oh, there's this whole thing about just the mealtime experience that I'd forgotten. I learned in sociology a long time ago, but I'd forgotten as a dietitian as I was practicing. And so out popped this idea. It took me, it didn't just pop out, it took about three or four years to rumble around in my, my thick head before it came out. And this is basically what it is. It's rather simplistic view, perhaps, um, but I think it holds, and we're going to hopefully test it in some of the research we're doing. The idea is we're trying to influence food intake. And so we think that there's three things that likely influence that, no matter where an older adult may be. It's meal access, so can they access food? Can they access the meal itself? Um, think about transportation, for example, in the community for older adults, or think about reaching a meal tray in an acute care setting. That influences food intake. There's this mealtime experience of this psychosocial, physical environment makes me want to eat. Think about when you go out with friends, you go to a new restaurant, it may not be very good food, you still eat the food? Yeah, when you're paying for it, supposedly. But also when you eat with other people, right? There's the same thing called social facilitation, where when you eat with people you like, you eat more. So Thanksgiving is coming up, don't eat with people you like and you won't overeat, I suppose. <laughs> anyway, that's social facilitation. So this idea of the mealtime experience, this is the thing that was missing for me in acute care and, or in chronic care. It's like, what is this about this mealtime experience? We think about sitting in a bed in a hospital. That's not a good mealtime experience, right? How do we change that? And then there's obviously the meal quality. So this is if you live in a community, what things you can choose to eat. Maybe you live in a community where you can't access a really good grocery store that's going to affect your meal quality as well. But what you actually end up choosing to make or do make, those choices around meal quality influence as well your food intake. The key I realized from doing this research for many years is that it has many levels of influence. And I've just shown you here making the most of mealtimes concept for long-term care. So you may not be aware, but, but each province um, controls how long-term care is provided in the province. And provincially, what will vary will be the amount of money they give a long-term care home per day to feed a resident. That obviously could impact meal quality, right? Mm. Then the home itself. The home might be a very progressive home that really is involved in training their older adults, thinking about Schlegel villages right now, or training their staff, really doing a good job of trying to support better quality care. And they really take a, a pride in doing that. So staff training, social model of care, et cetera, all those things. That likely influences mealtime experience, right? If they do a better job of those things. Then there's the staff itself. Are they well trained? What is their attitude towards older adults or attitude towards food and how we feed people, et cetera? And then the resident themselves, do they have dementia? Do they have eating problems? All those things are going to influence these three things which influence food intake, right? The M3 concept has tried to boil these down into various components. I won't talk about those right now, but just think about this is complex then. If we're trying to change nutritional status of older adults, it's not a simple bottle of something right? It's much more complex than that if we're going to have long-lasting change. And that's the trick. So my research programs are focused in three areas, and I'll just quickly go through um, them and then talk about two in much more detail, these two projects that I'm working on right now. So acute care, I'm interested in trying to improve nutrition care processes. And so you see this nice diagram that Jimmy, my student, developed. Is it over there? Nutrition care process. I realized through working as a dietitian, there's lots of things that go wrong in the system of why people aren't provided the food they need to eat, whether it be long-term care or acute care or in the community. No one's recognizing that people aren't eating well. Physicians don't necessarily ask an older adult, how's your eating, right? How's your appetite? Are you losing weight? They may not even think about it, or they may see that they are losing weight and just assume it's part of aging and not think about it as being something you can do something about. So that's this outer circuit here, this idea of nutrition care process. So in acute care, I'm doing some work of, of trying to basically change how a hospital does its work around nutrition. And that's a, a big job, and I'll talk a little bit about that study in, in just a moment. I'm also very interested, because of my work in the past, of how these people move back into the community. Because acute care is, no one wants to stay there, right? You don't want them there, and they don't want to stay there. They have to go back to the community. So we really need to think about transitions and how we improve that process so that people are being cared for in the way that they need to be. Long-term care. I'm interested in um, trying to improve food intake, and you'll see here I put in quality of life. Because for me, people living in long-term care, some might be near the end of life. And so improving their nutritional status isn't the point anymore, but improving their quality of life. And so if they want ice cream or they want chocolate cake for breakfast, we should be able to figure out how to do that, because that's quality of life, right? And food is quality of life. 
So the M3 prevalence study I'm going to talk a little bit about today, that study is just wrapping up, and so hopefully in a year's time we'll have amazing results to show you, but I'll talk about the study itself in just a moment. And then the last program research is focused in on the community, and this is this idea of diet resilience. How do we keep people resilient when it comes to your diet? So although they might require a walker and no longer drive their car, what can we do to support them so that they can make the best choices possible, eat the best quality food that they want to eat, and retain that quantum of health for as long as possible? So I'm really interested in um, my Nutri-East I'll show you what that looks like in just a moment, doing some work with this self-management platform. As well, I'm really interested in older adults with dementia and their care partners, so CP is care partners here. This is a specific group that's actually been quite neglected when you think about nutrition and extremely vulnerable. And so this group I'd like to do a lot more research on and need to find some time and maybe some more money to do that. But first off, East Screen, which is, um, Basically, it's a self-management platform, and I put the website up here for you so you can actually go to it. This is meant to address the needs of those older adults that are in the community, 50, 55 plus, that can start to change their own behavior and improve their health. This is the group that will never um, be targeted by a physician as having a nutrition problem, but they can still improve. Think about that vicious cycle I told you about where people might be losing weight and getting into trouble because they're not eating the right types of food. That goes on for 10 years, and they're malnourished, and they fall. So this idea of self-management is trying to get them to change and keep positive about their eating habits as long as possible, and that platform is there for you. The research that I'm trying to do on this at this point in time is linking this to our primary care system in some way. So if someone self-manages and takes these results to the primary care physician or dietitian, they can then be linked to that service in a better way than they are now. So early upstream prevention again. I'm going to switch now, though, to the acute care program uh, of research. And so this is through the Canadian Malnutrition Task Force, which I chair. We have done three studies now, two that I was the PI on, and the first one was more of a collaborative effort where we actually had uh, a broad group of researchers. I'm going to speak to that first study um, because it has some really interesting results that um, you probably have no idea what's going on in acute care. Anyway, this study is based on 1,000 patients, 18 hospitals, 8 provinces, the largest in the world most comprehensive data collection in the world. Uh, we did medical and surgical patients over the 18 years of age, quasi-random selection of the sample, and it's comprehensive. So let's uh, just describe briefly what I mean by comprehensive. So patients came in, we assessed them at admission in terms of nutritional status as well as why they might be malnourished or not on admission. Then every two days during their admission, we watched what happened to them. Did they have a fall or what we call an adverse event? Uh, did they have a stroke? Did they have dysphagia or swallowing problems developing? What happened in terms of diet prescription? Did anybody notice what was going on? And then we, just before they left the hospital, we also did um, a reassessment of nutritional status. We gave them a questionnaire to ask them what they thought about the food and about the quality of their nutrition care in the hospital. And we then followed them 30 days later after they got home to find out what happened between hospital and home. So I'm gonna try to show you those results on the patient level. In addition to that, though, we did focus groups with dietitians and other nutrition personnel in the hospital to understand why things are the way they are. I won't be talking about those results today. We also talked about physicians and nurses. We did a survey with them and find out what they know and what they don't know about nutrition. And it's quite revealing. Again, I won't be talking about that today, but I can certainly answer some questions if you have them later on. So basically, we identified there's a huge problem. And First off, I want to say this problem is worldwide. This is not Canada's only problem. But this is the first time we've shown in Canada in a large way that we also have a problem that UK, Europe, America, who don't want to study this at all, um, have. We all have this problem in acute care. Basically, when people walk into a medical and surgical hospital or unit, 45% are malnourished. And we didn't use something simple like BMI to say, or body mass index to say, are you malnourished? We actually used something called subjective global assessment, which is a standardized assessment that takes several minutes to do, but it's based on physical functioning of the body, how the body looks in terms of fat and muscle, history of food intake, weight loss, et cetera. It's a standardized assessment that's shown to be linked to mortality, length of stay in hospital, all sorts of things. So it's the best standard measure, 45%, one in two people coming into acute care in medical and surgical units is malnourished. Nutritional status deteriorates in hospital for about 20%. So they're going back out probably worse off than they came in. That's probably not surprising to some of you, um, but maybe, maybe it is for others. 
We also did food intake estimation, where the person estimated what they ate from their tray during the first week of their admission. And a very crude way of doing it, but in a thousand people, crude works. And in this estimation, we demonstrated that people that consumed less than half of the food provided on one meal were more likely to stay longer in hospital. And that was independent of their disease state, their age, their gender, all the things you might think that impact why you would stay longer in a hospital. So food intake alone. So you come in well nourished and you don't eat the food, you're gonna stay longer. Okay? So you have to eat the food when you're there, even if you don't like it, you have to eat it. The other key thing is that malnutrition was also an independent predictor of length of stay. And this is important because most people think, oh, people are malnourished when they're diseased. We controlled for disease. We controlled for number of medications. We controlled for cancer being present. We controlled for all the things that people say, oh, it's just the disease. It's not malnutrition. No, it's malnutrition. Okay? Malnutrition is also costly in human and financial terms. People that are malnourished takes two to three days longer. And Lori Curtis is my health economist here at University of Waterloo, who's going to be putting out a paper very shortly that shows this is a huge cost. If you think about how many patients go into a medical surgical unit in Canada, and one in two is malnourished, and they stay two to three days longer, that's expensive. Treatment improves outcomes. We know this from a variety of research, and I won't show you that today, but there is a variety of research that shows, shows that various strategies can improve food intake and body weight of people and help them to recover. But detection of those who need that treatment is ad hoc. And so we actually watched how many saw a dietitian. Any guesses how many saw a dietitian in a hospital? Sorry? Oh, it's higher than that. But yeah, but that, that you know, I, a lot of people think it's pretty small. It was actually 23%. The challenge was is they saw mostly well-nourished people. They missed three quarters of the malnourished people. So whatever the referral process was to getting to see a dietitian, which is a specialist resource, wasn't right. So people weren't um, identifying malnutrition. So I'm going to show you some of these results. So here we have the SGA, subject to global assessment. Well-nourished is light green. Um, gray is moderate malnutrition and severe malnutrition. And I show you this by age, because it shows you that the older age group is driving this prevalence, OK? So if you go into most acute care um, wards that are medical or surgical, the average age is 65 plus, right? And so this group is driving the malnutrition. So we have 34% um, the older adult being moderately malnourished and 11% being severely malnourished. It's important to remember these numbers because most people will notice this. They can see that someone's so severely wasted that they're probably malnourished. They don't notice this one. And regardless, in our, our, again, in our costing study, they stay the same length of time, okay? And so that's a significant issue that we're not identifying this group that is the moderately malnourished, which is the majority of the malnourished people. So who are these people that are malnourished? So we looked at, as I said, when they came into hospital, uh, what they were like. Now we had to exclude people with delirium and dementia, um, and so that would obviously remove some folks that are there that could be malnourished. So this is somewhat biased, I'll admit that. But this is a, um, a, a logistic regression uh, model or that basically shows the factors that are independently associated with being well-nourished, mildly to moderately malnourished, or severely malnourished. Having your adult child do your groceries you're more likely to be malnourished. So this is talking about frailty piece in the community again. People who have family helping out are often maybe not getting enough help, or they need more help than they're getting at this point in time, or different types of help, because it's leading to potentially malnutrition. So this is not a cause effect. I don't want to say that. There's something going on around that. As well, um, pre-admission, this is oral nutritional supplements, so things that you would drink that are protein drinks and things like that. There's a whole line of them that pharma produces. Um, if you're consuming those, you're more likely to be malnourished. So someone's identified you're not eating well and trying to supplement with these things, but it's not enough. 55% um, had what we call a Charleston comorbidity index greater than two. This means you had many conditions. You came into hospital with many things wrong with you, okay? You're gonna be more likely to be malnourished. That makes sense, right? And then we have people that were in hospital two or more times the last five years. These, this is a revolving door of acute care that we're trying to fix, but no one's recognized that actually malnutrition is part of this. It's not just frailty, it's not just medication management, it's not just getting the person home with the types of social supports that they think they need to have. It's also about malnutrition that we're not addressing in our system at this point in time. 
So remember I told you there was this patient survey at the end of their stay. This is the things they said were the problems. And basically you can see from this, we have food access problems in acute care. And I would even venture to say it's food insecurity, okay? 20% can't reach their meal. Their meal tray's over there and they're in bed. No one's thought to bring it right to them. 30% can't open the packages of the food. I can't open packages, right? But uh, they really can't as well. And so this is an issue. We have to think about talking to our food producers about how to make easy to open packages. 69% when they were missed a meal were never given food. So in a hospital, people are taken away for tests and they miss meals, right? No one thinks that when they come back up to the ward and say it was supper they missed, they won't have anything for until eight or nine the next morning. And there's no food on the unit to give them. They've gotten rid of little kitchenettes on most units, right? Um, those people who needed help did not get it, 42%. So eating assistance, so someone maybe had broken their arm or was just too weak to feed themselves, 40% said they needed help and they didn't get it. 27% were in a poor position for eating, so laying in their bed trying to drink their tea. 42% were interrupted by the staff. This is staff coming in to poke and prod, to ask a question or two, do rounds, that sort of thing. Not good for your mealtime experience. And then 58% did not want the food they got because maybe a diet removed the things they wanted to eat, which means we have to do some work with dietitians and others who order these diets. And then 39% were disturbed at meals. This is noise on the unit, bells ringing, maybe the um, cleaning staff were cleaning the washroom at the same time in their room, all these things. Again, not a very nice mealtime experience. If we look now at the post-discharge data, this is something I'm just working on right now. I haven't published it yet. But it shows, again, between the, those less than 65 and those greater than or equal to 65, some of the differences. And I'll just highlight a few key things. So older adults are less likely to be eating often or always than younger adults with others. So they're going home alone to eat, right? And so that social facilitation isn't going to be happening for them. So think about that vicious cycle again. They've been in hospital, not eating well, maybe losing weight. They go home, and their appetite's still bad and no one's there to eat with that might stimulate that eating to happen, right? 31% are uh, preparing their own meals versus 47%. This means they're relying on others, so whether it be family or meal programs or things like that, so there's reliance on these other activities or other, other services. 26% lose five or more pounds in 30 days after that's to hospital. So I told you that they came in malnourished, 20% got worse, most stayed the same, but 20% got worse, and then another good portion of older adults lose more weight once they leave the hospital. No wonder we have that revolving door of going back into acute care, right? And after 30 days, 30% 30 also reported a very poor appetite. So what are we doing about this? So we did this study with the Canadian Malnutrition Task Force, and then people said, well, you have to do something about it now, and I knew that, but um, we weren't sure exactly how to go about doing it. So we um, received some funding from Technology Evaluation for the Elderly Network. I won't talk too much about that because we're running short on time. But the key is that we've developed an evidence-based algorithm for the detection, treatment, and monitoring of malnutrition amongst acute care medical and surgical patients. It was developed through consensus from leading Canadian experts, clinicians, and other stakeholders. We did this in one year, so it was a lot of work um, to do that. And this algorithm we consider a minimum standard. So hopefully hospitals see it as a minimum and go above and beyond to provide quality care. This is sort of the process we undertook. Again, I'm not gonna describe this in detail. It was quite a detailed study where we did uh, various phases to develop this impact using Delphi and environmental scans, et cetera. We also created some tools to support the impact. And we're now just launching a study that actually implements it. And so um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment after I show you the actual integrated nutrition pathway for acute care. So this is the pathway. And it makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, but the key is we have to test it now, and that's what we're doing is a more to eat study. Does this work? And does it actually improve what we think is the nutrition care process? And so what we're advocating for is when a patient comes into a medical or surgical unit, someone screens them to identify their nutrition risk. Two quick questions. Then they're triaged by doing subjective global assessment, that quick assessment that says, are you really malnourished? And if you're not, you just get standard care. Standard care is someone opens your packages, someone gives you your food basic things that everybody should get in the hospital, right? This, what we call advanced nutrition care is for people that are not really super malnourished, but certainly more food would help, some oral nutrition supplements between meals perhaps would help, maybe some looking into their preferences and needs, et cetera, would help. Then we have the specialized nutrition care, which means the dietitian needs to get involved and in caring for the patient. 
So the more to eat study is about taking action because I can tell you right now, this means changing what you do. If you can imagine a hospital changing what it does is not easy, right? And so we developed this more to eat study, which is an implementation study, which means implementation science, which I didn't know what that was three years ago, um, but how to get people to change their behavior in a uh, healthcare setting, not easy. We're gonna try to do it anyway. Um, so the, the objectives of the study are to develop this program that actually helps people to implement the impact and to test and evaluate the actual implementation of five diverse, diverse hospitals in four provinces. So these diverse hospitals will do it differently. Someone who, who screens might be a, di um, a diet tech in one area, one might be a nurse, et cetera. They will figure it out. We don't tell them how to figure it out. We give them a bit of money to help them with the process and with the evaluation bit, and we watch what happens. So it's called developmental evaluation. We're watching as it unfolds, which means it's kind of interesting from a re research perspective and, and understanding what's going on. We're also doing um, a sub-study which does high protein, and that's a colleague at Western University who's doing that piece. I'm not doing that part. So it's a large group. I'm not going to go through who these people are. We have international and national um, investigators for the sub-study as well as for the main study. Oh, sorry. I'm going back. Oh, this is... Can't go back this way. The old-fashioned way. Lots of collaborators, both on campus and off, and lots of students involved. And stakeholders and collaborators across the Canada, Canada and beyond. And this is what it looks like. And I'm not going to go through this because we're short on time. But the point is, this is complex. And this is uh, stretching my capacity some days, I can tell you that right now. But we're just at this stage of what we call developmental phase. Next year, we're going to go in implementation, and we're going to watch how these units unfold in terms of trying to change what they do. If they're not screening, getting doing screening. If they're not actually triaging patients to, di to a dietitian, doing that. All those things along the line. So it's extremely complex data collection. I must say, ethics office, you guys have been great in terms of looking at all my stuff because it's been complex. These are some of the things we're collecting, just to show you very quickly, and I've got to move on. Um, but it's, again, very complex. We're collecting things at the patient level and the staff unit and site level, and we're trying to watch how it happens. So it's different than an outcome evaluation. So what this study will tell us is, can we change nutrition care for the better? Can we detect and treat and monitor people better than we're doing now? using the impact as that framework for doing it. What are the resource implications of this improved nutrition care? It's going to cost mu something, right, to do this, but it's, uh, how much does it cost? What are the inputs, facilitators, barriers, et cetera? What components of impact are more readily implemented, and does this improve patient-reported outcomes, and what are the gaps that we still need to work on? So I'm very briefly going to spend about three minutes on residential care, which is my other big research program, um, and won't do it justice, but I'll try to give you a sense and the flavor of what we're doing. So 5% of older adults in Canada are in long-term care or residential care. And these individuals are there because they have cognitive and functional changes that don't allow them to be in the community anymore. They can't stay there independently. So they're very vulnerable, right? They're often the last tr transition a person will make other than perhaps going to acute care for something that is emergent that they have to address. And we're seeing because of um, the shift in views about how care should be provided in long-term care, that people are moving towards a culture change towards more social mode of care. This is a person's home. This is the last few years of their life. Maybe we do things a little bit differently than we do in an acute care setting because of that. So what we know about residential living in Canada is not much. There's very few studies that have actually looked at this. And you can imagine trying to get into a long-term care home and talk about malnutrition is going to be hard, right? <laughs> They're going to not want you in there because it gives a negative image, et cetera. We do know from a variety, uh, or we, uh, we think that undernutrition is about 50% or more of older adults in long-term care. That's not to be unexpected. Again, these people are moving towards the end of their life. Some of them are very close to the end of life. Of course, they're going to lose weight. Of course, they're not eating. That's part of the trajectory of life, right? So we expect some level of undernutrition. But 50, 60, 70% isn't appropriate. There's something we need to be doing about that. We do know that there is negative effects of undernutrition for this segment alone. So there are only 5% of older adults. They are in one in 10 beds in acute care in Canada. So they use acute care services a lot because something's going wrong with their care and their health, all right? So they're high use of the acute care system, which means something's going wrong that we need to be thinking about. Poor food intake is extremely common, um, 1,600 calories and lower for those with dementia. 
so not enough to meet their nutrient needs. So what can be done? A variety of things. We had a think tank here last year uh, with international experts to talk about what can be done. So things like improving self-feeding, changing the ambience of the dining room, for example, staff, attitude, knowledge, skills, time, all these things people thought could be fixed. And we also, a very uh, similar time frame, did a scoping review that showed there is literature to support these things. So we need to be doing these things that are effective, like individualization of uh, care roles and modifying work roles and training of staff, or doing a better job with menu planning, so actually putting enough nutrients on the plate and food that people want to eat on the plate, right? So there's lots of things that can be done. So the M3 prevalence <coughs> study is, its aim is to identify basically the key drivers of food intake and long-term care that can be the basis for multimodal interventions. There's lots of reasons why it's wrong, what's going on in terms of food intake. There's lots of potential interventions, but we don't know where to invest our money. You want to pick those things that you can fix uh, or provide um, benefits to most of the residents rather than just a few key people. And so that's what this study is about. So our research questions are to determine what is the prevalence of inadequate energy, protein, micronutrient, and food intake of residents in Canada across uh, four provinces, and what is the independent and interrelated association between multi-level uh, de determinants of energy and protein intake for these residents. This is the biggest study in the world on long-term care, and it's almost done. It's quite exciting. And this is the M3 team, again, some students from here and some national experts from across Canada. So what we're doing is a multi-site cross-sectional study for provinces. Why these four? Because there's actually researchers that knew what to do in those provinces. There's actually very few people in Canada who do long-term care nutrition research. Actually, three of us are dietitians we're and uh, are involved in that, and one is a nurse, because some of these provinces didn't have a dietitian PhD that could do this research. Eight long-term care homes are chosen from each province. And of course, we had to choose them. We couldn't randomly select them. That's kind of hard to do, especially when people won't let in the door. So we had to choose them, but we chose them looking for diversity in their characteristics. 20 residents per home go through the process of data collection, which is extensive. And we do a three-day weighed food intake record. If anybody's tried to watch what they eat for a day and you had to weigh it, you know how hard this is. It took two people, one of them, two of them are in the room, 11 hours a day, basically, watching what people ate huge time commitment to do this well. But we will have the best data collection in the world on this because we invested in that way. This is all the things that we collected, and this is not the level of detail, um, but basically I want to show you here that we're collecting all those levels we talked about in that M3 concept, looking at meal quality, meal access, meal time experience, looking at the resident, the staff, the, the residents itself, and provincial characteristics to try and understand what are the big drivers. Maybe it's as simple as giving more food money to homes, and that will solve the problem. This data set will let us understand if, that, if that's the case and why we again chose four provinces. Different provinces have different funding models for food and long-term care. So the big takeaways. Older adults are nutritionally vulnerable. Poor food intake starts in the community for a variety of reasons. We saw that 45% coming into acute care, malnourished. That started somewhere else. Acute care stay can promote nutritional vulnerability and the More to Eat project will pr improve nutrition care processes, we hope. Residential care is especially vulnerable. There's a tension between quality of life and food for health. There's multiple drivers for that food intake, and the endemic nature of undernutrition or malnutrition makes it challenging to think about what we're going to try to achieve, as well as what we need to think about in terms of doing interventions to reach all. M3 will identify the targets for that intervention. So hopefully the next decade of my life will be very busy doing that. Self-management for well older adults is a priority, and nutrient screen is one of those ways of doing self-management. So just to acknowledge some resources there, and we have some discussion. <laughs> Thank you very kindly, Heather. Uh, I assume that you're willing to uh, entertain some questions? I am. Yeah. And uh, I could stand here and sort of field the questions, but I think that's a bit redundant, so feel free to field your own questions. Sure. Thank you. Remember, for the webcasting, if you want to ask a question, the microphone will appear at your place, okay? Okay, go ahead. Hi, so I think a lot of us in the audience are in the position of the old, older children of adults, so what can we do to help prevent our own like aging parents get into those categories yeah. now? Yeah. So I think um, 
figuring out and, and helping them understand that nutrition is important to their health. I think a lot of older adults get to the point where they think, oh, it doesn't matter what I eat, right? So reminding them that actually what you de eat, do eat is actually very important. In fact, as you age, you probably have to be more nutrient dense than what you eat, so that means better quality of what you eat and less calories. And so encouraging them to, to do that, as well as exercise. So those two things together, I think, will do a lot for chronic disease prevention and health. So that alone is a big piece. And then when they become having challenges with getting that food access going or um, not wanting to eat, eating with them, right? Helping them out with groceries, for example, or facilitating some of those services so that they can actually have the access they need to food. That'd be key. Yeah. Oh, I one up there first, maybe. Or, yeah. We'll have uh, Sabrina running back and forth getting exercise. Thank you, that was great. I'm not, well, I, I have older adult parents, but I'm afraid I might be in that older yeah, adult I know. section <laughs> myself. Everything's relative. I know. Um, it struck me when you were talking about the, the acute care where people were staying, yeah. you said like three to five days longer, two to three two days, to three long, days yeah. but yeah. that's big money. It is big money. And it strikes me as that's an, out, an, an end point that can be measured very quickly yeah. if, so it's, you might actually have a chance to really influence policy yep. if you get more food in them in a sh because it's in that that very stay i take exactly it, that you can show it's on average two to three days shorter i would think you might actually get people paying for better food because yep. i bet you that's cheaper exactly. than paying for them to be in hospital exactly and so that's really exciting it is really exciting and so one of the next things i think we're going to be doing at the cmtf level Canadian malnutrition task force is actually pull together um, all the research that shows that um, the things we can do to promote food intake in hospital have benefit to the patient uh, in terms of whether it be better food intake, because we now have the study that shows poor food intake leads to length of stay problems, right? So if we can just show better food intake because these things are happening, we should invest in those things. So maybe we should spend more than $6 on a tray of food or a day's worth of food in hospital, right? Yeah. This fellow here has got a question in front. So maybe this is from a bit of a cross-disciplinary perspective, yeah. but just talking about the shifting dietary needs of older people. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I'm just wondering how that could affect um, our food resources in terms of you know climate change and things like that. Yeah. We want to be limiting um, foods that have to travel long distances to get here. That's right. And uh, certain high-protein things you know that aren't um, animal meats and things like that could actually require those kinds of transports. So. Uh, I guess, would you, or have you looked into it all, um, how the sort of diet that you're proposing would actually impact um, our availability to eat more locally versus globally? Yeah. I haven't, but it's an excellent question. And just even think about the beans idea. So if we're trying to get people to move towards more Mediterranean style diet, and more fruits and vegetables during the winter season, we have them available in Canada now compared to we, what we used to, but certainly they're expensive, right, to get here. Um, but think about beans, for example, and uh, this is just a, um, a sort of a, a, an aside, but older adults have lots of gastrointestinal issues. So suggesting they eat more beans right away is a bit of a challenge, right? And so there's all these things that have to be thought through and why we end up with the food behaviors we do have, right? So certainly we're trying to promote a more plant-based diet, but think about the protein issue. How do we get good quality protein into people? Maybe it is soy, but some people are allergic to soy, for example, lentils, et cetera. But that is a challenge then because we have these other issues that go along with it. So it is a very difficult situation. Great idea, though, for a PhD thesis. <laughs> Heather, thanks very much for yeah. this great talk. Um, I was really delighted to listen to your lecture. Um, quite often, my wife tells me, stop thinking like an engineer, but mm. said, hey. Uh, <laughs> that's that's uh, something that you don't let it go easily. So if you if I look at your formula, a uh, person weighing 80 kilograms must take about 64 grams of uh, protein a day, yeah. and you can equate to how many eggs or you know yeah. what kind of steak. Yeah. Uh, and then I say, okay, if I know exactly if I put one liter of 98 octane gasoline in a car. I can account for every centiliter of this mm -hmm. fuel where it will go. Mm -hmm. So if we apply this and you have a study going, mm -hmm. you, you watch what people eat for three days, right. um, is it possible to account for this in terms of body Very temperature, mm -hmm. blood work, mm -hmm. and if this protein or calories, if they're not being used in a way 
what happens to them. And if, yeah. you, if you could measure the other <laughs> outputs, you know, for yeah. the, 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 the common ones, is it possible to use the blood work, as a, uh, for yeah, example, absolutely. as a marker to figure out what's happening to your protein or Definitely, and, and we've got a protein specialist in my kinesiology faculty right over there, Marina. Um, and this is the great thing about it being in a kin department. I'm the most applied of the group, but there's a whole lot of other folks that do more of that basic science and, and those sorts of things that really help out the message. Um, protein is one of those things we can get a pretty good sense of measurement wise. Other nutrients are a bit of a challenge because where is the storage pool in the body and how do you access it? And not always are the blood markers the right ones that we're looking for. Take serum calcium, for example, totally useless tool. Calcium is deposited in the bone. And so bone mineral density tells us how much calcium you have in your body, not your serum calcium. So it, it, nutrients are challenging that way because not all of them are readily accessible to understand what's going on with them. Um, and we have, as I say, lots of nutritional scientists in kin that actually do that which is wonderful because we do need to improve our biomarkers so we can understand if we're doing some changes around nutrition behavior, do we see this outcome? But to answer your question about protein, there is no storage pool for protein in the body. It is your muscle. And if you're not using it, you're losing it. So there is some serum proteins that are going around circulating, but there is no ex excess protein in the body, right? Unlike fat, there's excess of that but there is no excess protein in the body. And so this is why it's such a challenge with when thinking about nutrition for older adults because there is no reserve of muscle. There's reserve of fat, right? Um, this is kind of a stretch, but I was just thinking about how um, protein is an issue and there's been research on um, eating insects <laughs> for nutrition and they're very low calorie, but very nutritious. High protein, yeah. um, and I was wondering if you would think it would be possible to implement that in sure. diet in the future. Yeah. But I know that's very taboo because eating insects is mm. not always appetizing for certain people yeah. who aren't as <laughs> adventurous. No, it's, a, it's a great so. idea. And I was in Africa, I don't know, 15 years ago, and they ate them straight out, like, you know, still alive sort of thing. But when there's a big season, I can't remember what it's called, and there's a whole lot of these insects, and they just ate them the way they were. I think we'd have to grind them up and put them in bread, maybe, mm -hmm. to get them consumed <laughs> by our population. But this is where, you know, the marriage of food scientists, a nutritional scientist, a dietitian makes a lot of sense. And I actually have some colleagues that oh, learn to this. Oh. Okay, up the back there. I would like to know how these numbers in Canada um, compared to France, for example, yeah. where you know eating style is quite different. Do right. you have any information on this? Well, I can tell you that France has the same problem, and most of Europe the same problem around nutrition risk of older adults, and it's because their demography is about 15 years ahead of us, right? There's a much older group in Europe than in Canada and North America. So we still see nutrition risk around the world, and it goes along with the demography, all right? In terms of um, nutrition, in terms of things like the Mediterranean diet, et cetera, it seems to be the best regions are Spain and Italy to live, France not so much. I mean, there certainly is the, the wine and chocolate paradox that goes along with the French way of living, uh, but I think it's also walking a lot in, in, in Europe and other things like that. So it's not just diet. Um, lifestyle is a large part of it that we have to think about. So France is not considered one of the better nation's diets to follow. It is the Mediterranean region. Yeah. They do, and they take time to eat, right? Which I love about that. They come home and they relax. And so even though they may be eating high fat, uh, cold cuts, they're relaxing while they do it. And so it's not just what you eat, it's how you eat it. Thank you very kindly, Heather. Thank you. There was one hand up, which was yours. We don't have time to do it now, but I'm sure Heather would be more than willing to answer your question uh, in a one-on-one -on -one at the end of this. Uh, as you can probably tell from my body confirmation that I love any discussion about food, <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, I'm looking forward to be even more elderly than I am now so that I can participate in some of your research. <laughs> Eating insects is an interesting concept. Yeah. Most of the world does eat them. Yeah. We just don't do it in North America to a great degree. And I was in Beijing um, about three years ago when there was a plague of locusts had come in from the west and invaded Beijing. 
and they were being deep fried and sold as street food. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think they were perhaps daring me to try this, but um, I did try them and they were great. The one thing that they forgot to tell me is you're not supposed to eat the wings, okay? So the wings are, are crunchy and not really all that appetizing, but if you remove the wings, they're actually pretty good. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Very much appreciate your time, and I hope you enjoyed the seminar today. Uh, the next in this series will be on uh, November the 11th, when uh, Professor Susan Tai from the Department of Civil Engineering will talk about uh, smart paving, and actually paving that generates energy. Have a great uh, rest of the day and an even better weekend.